All right, let's look at um, a problem which is growing, and we don't know what to do about it. <clears throat> How many are following the National Football League uh, suits that are going on right now about was I hurt in the past, this, that, another thing? Just understand, head injury when, you, when I started, um, and there's plenty of old guys in this room who all remember the same thing. We'd watch kids brought in on Friday evening from high school football games. And they'd say something like, well, he had his bell rung, right? Whatever that means, had his bell rung. And you and I would sit there thinking, well, what do we got to do here? We got to make sure he doesn't have a subdural or an epidural, right? Because that's all we knew about in those days. That is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about all kinds of things which have long-term implications, right, down the road. <clears throat> there are medical legal disasters. One of them is you've decided, you haven't said anything to the parents about the follow-up situation, return to play. If you're an emergency doc and you don't understand the phrase return to play, you're not where everybody is today. Because, and it's not just boys in football. What about girls and soccer? Should they be wearing a helmet? All these questions come up. But there is, there's already been some legal activity <clears throat> about, well, a year later, my kid's not doing as well in school. You let them go back to, uh, to play and that sort of thing. As far as I'm concerned, there shouldn't be a high school <clears throat> or junior high school that doesn't have a return to play program a specific doctor who sees them. Do kids lie a lot, by the way? <laughs> Shit, all the time, that's what they do. Yeah, well, I didn't do that. How are you? Fine. And our parents worse. Well, I want my boy back in the game. Oh my God. No, you don't. Well, he's all right. How many fingers, you know, they do this, they, how many fingers am I holding up, kind of thing? <clears throat> and it varies town to town. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, where you can pick your specialty at any sports event, right? Well, there's two or three orthopods, a neurosurgeon. They're all in the stands. And pretty much everybody's now gone to the uh, return to play stuff. The National Hockey League does it. They haul them under the stands. They have them go back and do the things they did. Now, you always got to put it in context, right? Where are the Canadians? Yeah. So how do you know if a Canadian is brain dead? I mean, that's, that's the question, right? <laughs> Here, repeat this. Good gold, Derry. I actually grew up in a high school where I watched. I was across from Amherstburg, Ontario. So uh, we, could, we, all, we all knew about uh, uh, all, you know, Montcalm and all that kind of stuff. We knew all that stuff. But what we also knew is <coughs> hockey was one of those games where people did get their bell rung. You know, I had a kid who played hockey, and we were all, in the old days, we were back to putting them back way too soon. So just understand, <clears throat> the world has changed. Your liability is greater. Nobody in this room should be sending a kid back to play unless they're rechecked. That's it. And, and it's, it's just a different world than when I was a kid. All right, challenges involving minor pediatric head trauma. The problem is in the definition. Who's got minor trauma? It's like the term minor neurosurgery. My family doesn't have minor neurosurgery. Minor thoracic surgery, I always loved that one too. No. Uh, <clears throat> whenever you're dealing with head trauma, you've got to decide what they put into it. This, ti this title requires uh, head injury is a huge problem, number one. People come in every day. There are between 600,000 and a million. Why can't we know exactly? Because they come in with other injuries. So they got their head, but, but maybe the principal injury is their leg or their chest or you know, whatever else got hit during this event. We don't know, but it's at least a minimum of 600,000 visits. So it's not simple. The other thing is, We've mentioned three times already in this course that shooting CT scans has a downside. 
not just a financial downside, but a potentially medical downside. What do you want? <clears throat> so here's what we want in any scoring system before we shoot rads at people. Number one, don't miss surgical disease. But you won't miss surgical disease. Get that right now from, from as we go through the studies. I can't think in my career, which is now 41 years, that a subdural and epidural, those people had a lot more trauma, right? They look sicker, and they were going downhill. Uh, pretty much your examination is, you know, I don't want to be a broken record here, but examination, examination, examination. If you don't know how to examine, learn. The old guys are not a problem. The young guys really are. Residents come back to me, and they wouldn't know how to examine to save their soul. Do real stuff. Number two, keep radiation down. We talked about that. We want, there's no use in sticking most people in the hospital. Hospitals, and, and I don't know how many of you, how many of you are in rural areas where there is no immediately available neurosurgeon? Yeah. <clears throat> I'd hate to tell you about the cases that I've had to go to court on where somebody decided to admit a kid to the hospital overnight. Don't ever do, in a place that doesn't, deal with neuro injury. Don't ever do that. Because the nurses on the floor are not trained to handle that problem. Now when they go bad, what do you have to do with them? Transfer them. And if, you, if you've never seen that go bad, I mean, I've got a bunch, I've got a pile of those cases, emergency docs should have made a different decision early on. Don't admit people to hospitals that can't take care of the problem when the case goes bad. It just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> we gotta deal with something called patient satisfaction. Do you like that? Not really, no. You wanna take the attitude, me Tarzan, you banana shit, okay? I'm in charge here, but the bottom line is you're gonna have to spend some time with some parents uh, as to what you're gonna do. Because what, what do a lot of people believe when their kid's brought in with a, hit their head bump, they're gonna get what? A CT scan. I remember the old days when we used to talk about, uh, they wanted skull x-rays. <clears throat> now the skull x-ray, we all know, is essentially a, hist of, a test of historical interest only. Uh, but they used to ask for skull x-rays, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Now the federal government has done us all a great favor. They've sent out this stuff everywhere. It's on the internet, all over the place about the danger of radiation. So I always take a positive approach was, I'm so happy that I don't have to shoot dangerous ionizing radiation at your child's head. You wouldn't want that unless they needed it, would you? So what are they gonna say? Now, I light the kid up. I don't care. I don't like him. <clears throat> They're not going to do that. It's, it's just one of, it's, it's a rarity now. It's okay. But use intellectual jujitsu to get them to do other things before they do this to their kid. And number two, whether there's a scan done or not, you tell them, we're not done here. This is the long term. A short term and a long term. And uh, you know all the new data about if they've had three concussions in a row, short period of time, all this sort of thing. Pay attention to that. Let them hear it from you as well. Because uh, it's, it's not good to do it otherwise. And then there's the, um, <clears throat> obviously, there are the political questions with you and the um, sports teams and the coaches and everything else at schools Make sure you establish what that order is and what's going to be done by protocol. Not because some guy needs him back in the game for the, uh, you know, for the playoffs or something like that. Just be a little careful here because you can have some real problems. All right, question one. What are the, cl cl the clinical decision aids uh, or rules that we're going to use? Everybody wants an aid to decide which kid is going to get the study. That's it. That's the only question in your head. 
Why? Because you looked at them and examined them. If they're a, a Glasgow Coma Scale 15, they're sitting there. What are the chances they've got something that I'm, remember how I'm saying this now, not a finding, because they're going to be findings on, on x-ray, right? Which you're not going to fix or have nothing to do with anything. As you look at some of these studies, you've got to ask this question. What finding is it? Because they say, well, he had sinusitis. He had impacted sinuses. Does that count for anything? No. If you send off enough CT scans, you will get that comment. Or they've got vacuoles, or they've got this. Or this. It's like sending off back films, and the radiologist reported a Schmorl's nodule. Well, what the hell's that? It's a finding that radiologists get to put down, and it makes them have a positive film. But it has nothing to do with the patients in there. So just be real careful about what you mean when you read the studies as what's a positive finding, because they'll say, well, we had kids with normal exams, and 4% had positive findings. Well, 4% of them had a subdural that needed draining. No, that number's down so low, one in 10,000, that sort of thing, it's unbelievably low. Because most people with real injuries have what? Positive examinations. So kind of keep that now. <clears throat> there is something that went on, however, which is worth talking about. Question number two, what about the PCARN network? You should all know about PCARN, because it's big. It's what we go by now in this country, and that's the Pediatric Care Applied Research Network. It's a collection of uh, 18 affiliated pediatric centers, 18 of them that put together their data. What does that mean? They have adequate numbers. It's an adequately powered study to kind of know what's going on. And so they went through ch uh, children's uh, head trauma, and they basically divided it into two groups. Under, those under two years of age and those over. Now the vast majority, you gotta remember, when you're dealing with he head injury children under two years of age, there are other possibilities here. Is it child abuse? You know, is it these other sorts of things? Different series of questions. Now as you get older, it's, it's athletic stuff. Under two, you rarely fall off your bicycle. Why? because you aren't riding a bicycle. Uh, so this is not a bad place to have this separation. And uh, so as you read the stuff, this is what we do. Uh, by the way, in June, two th in September of 2006, um, they looked at, looked at 34,000 patients enrolled. 34,000 is a reasonably respectable number here. Because whenever you have a disease that has what? Very few positives. It's like shooting neck x-rays, right? For years we shot everybody's neck. How many positive findings were there? Damn near none that you couldn't predict when you looked at them, right? You kind of knew who was sick and who wasn't. 34,000 in the uh, PCARN trial is good. And so uh, we, we knew what we needed to do to validate, get real numbers. The PCARN data is not random. It is not controlled in that way. You know what it is? Observational data. We looked at 34,000 kids. This is what we found, but it in no way divided the kids up <coughs> as to what, the, what they're gonna get. Um, how was PCARN inducted, and what did they find? <coughs> Excuse me. Basically, what they said is this. If you're under two years of age, and you have normal mental status, you're not actively vomiting, you had no loss of consciousness, um, uh, you had a, a not lethal mechanism, you know, you weren't thrown out the car window sort of thing. It's interesting, this is what they set up. They made it real hard here, because pretty much you can figure this kind of stuff. Uh, no signs of a basilar skull fracture, 
and no severe headache, why are you doing a study on those people? Why are you doing something? Nobody knows why. Because there was no evidence that they missed anybody. Now the truth is, if you went back, the vomiting thing didn't work out really. You aren't any sicker if you vomit or not vomit. A lot of people do have vomiting. Didn't make any difference. And we'll get, we'll get to that study. <coughs> so what you're really interested in, and let me give you the paper to star and take home. It's paper no, number one, which is by a friend of ours, Nate Cooperman. Nate Cooperman is a great guy. Um, he's here in California. I think he's at Davis. But what you're looking at is if you follow all of those things I recommended, you're talking about needed surgery in that group or needed intervention by a neurosurgeon. That's not surgery, but they maybe had to come in and say, yeah, we'll watch them overnight. That it got included. You're talking about not 1%. You're talking about 0.14%. Pretty much if they look normal, they are normal. They are normal. Then if you look at, at the data, well, what about that 0.14%? None of them was a subdural or an epidural. Nothing. So pretty much if you follow the PCARN data, what's the sensitivity? If they had something real, just by physical examination, you picked up 99. 9%, and the specificity was pretty decent. What about severe mechanisms of injury? This, I think, for emergency doctors is very tough. And, and if you look at Article 2, prevalence of clinical important treatment, who's who had what, uh, you're again looking at 0.3%, uh, 0.6%. It's still rare. No matter what we did, let's say we shot this kid out of a cannon. Big mechanism. But big mechanism and bad disease have what? Findings. So no matter what story they told you, exam looks good, you're looking at minuscule stuff, and that's just to have the neurosurgeon take a look not saying they have to go in. Does a period of ops, here, here's the next one. This is the real guts of this question. In the emergency department, okay, we've got, jo that, uh, we've got Johnny, 14, hitting the head through his helmet, uh, baseball. Okay, we've done the initial examination, the good neuro exam. You know, walk on his heels, walk on his toes, does he have pronator drift? Yada, yada, yada. Normal. How are you going to decide at this moment in time, what are you going to do with the family? All that kind of stuff. We want to test. Well, what about a period of observation? Is that a reasonable way to go? Well, the truth of the matter is, you can do whatever you want politically with the family. I use that all the time. I'll be back to re-examine him. But did, a, did, but did a period of observation really change very much what people actually found it did? The answer is no. They either came in and looked bad, or an hour later they looked about the same, no matter which way you, you go. Now, do I use it politically? Yes. Do I believe the literature says it helps in sorting patients out? The answer is no. There are some people you walk in the room and say, you aren't right, over to the machine. You get another group that no matter what they did, no matter what they said, they have a normal exam, and re-examining again in an hour makes almost no difference. What about, um, what about the, the yield of using a CT scan in a child with a bleeding disorder? That's a fair question. How's your kid? He's good except for his hemophilia. Anybody like that sound? No, no, we don't want to hear that. Did it actually make any difference? No, 
if they met the criteria on examination that we talked about, one, two, three, four, five, none of these kids were going to go, and it, literally it's none. It's zero, went on to have a, a bad outcome. So because they have some, I don't care if they've got Leiden or factor this or that, there isn't any indication that those kids should have a normal exam and be worse and you find something on the CT scan. You don't CT scan for their underlying um, hematologic problem. That's not why we do it. By the way, what about all the other things that are available? And Dr. Little was very kind when he did this chapter. You'll find other things other than the PCORN. You'll find various decision-making aids from other places in the world, the NICE uh, criteria, this, that, and other thing. But there is a cross-channel difference, which is huge. If you actually look at what they do <clears throat> in Europe, I think this is basically uh, uh, England, and they looked at the PCORN data, the NICE data, the Nexus 2 data, all this kind of stuff, University of California, Davis. Uh, here's the key. There is a default position which is different in the two countries. If there's a question in this country, what do we do? We scan them. The Europeans do not believe that, and the difference is huge. If you look at the actual numbers, <coughs> we do about two and a half times more on a group that by our own data would say that their examination, nobody's talking here about the child with a disconjugate gaze, okay? None of this is about this. But if you look at this data, the, the European data, the, the decision rules, they're half as likely, less than half as likely, to just scan. Are they missing, well, does that mean, are we right or they're right? <coughs> well, you can't find a lot of people laying around in England who they've missed. It's just a cultural difference between the two groups, and it's significantly different. Um, let me just move on for just one second here. How do clinical judgment compare? And this is a great paper. Again, if I have to give you a paper to star, it's how does clinical judgment compare to the use of decision rules, decision aids? You know, you're under two, you did this, you did that. How about for people who didn't do a formal decision but they had their own internal decision mechanism? Like all of us do who've practiced for any period of time, right? It's like we talked about with sick kids, and do we catheterize them, yes or no? If they look well, what do most of us experienced guys do who aren't at academic centers? We don't cath them. Well, that's exactly what this question came up with, and what they basically say is, and the, the title is, clinical judgment versus decision rules. Are they at bigger risk? And what it basically said was, those people who didn't follow any clinical decision rule had about the same outcomes as everybody else. So <coughs> whenever we're talking about decision rules, put that down. You have gotta use some flexibility here. And um, <coughs> let me just, I wanna make sure I hit another paper which is worth looking at. And that's, <coughs> excuse me, paper 10. My child is vomiting after he hit his head. Anybody heard that? <coughs> and, and all of us went for years not knowing how to put that into the equation. Paper 10 says it doesn't make much difference. <coughs> there are kids who have head injuries. The examination shows they have a head injury. They're not vomiting. There are kids who have no other findings but just vomiting. Vomiting itself should not determine whether you do the study. 
It's a, and, and paper 10 says that pretty clearly. Vomiting doesn't count. It, it shouldn't be the determiner <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of, why, of why you're doing certain things. All right. Uh, <laughs> I want to make sure I, I get all the important papers here. <coughs> <laughs> oh, we mentioned this earlier. <laughs> Incidental findings on CT don't count. You can't say, oop, thank you. You can't say you've got a positive CT because it's got some other finding unrelated to the trauma. So you have to look very carefully when they say we've got a 1% CT scan positivity. What are they reporting here? Because if you're reporting packed sinuses, if you're reporting nodules, if you're reporting all this other kind of stuff, let's say you accidentally discovered a meningioma. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you found it, uh, and you'd have to talk to the family, about, but it has nothing to do with the trauma situation. So incidental findings cannot be thrown in here and included in the data. Uh, oh, we all talked throughout our youth about something called delayed bleeding, right? Well, maybe they're gonna come back. Again, we're talking about children who do not have a potential space. This isn't an old guy. Look at Bukata back there. I mean, that's an old guy. And your brain does move slowly away from the skull. There is a potential space in, in the elderly. We've all seen it. We've seen chronic subdurals, that kind of stuff. Kids don't have that space. So is there such a thing as delayed bleeding? Article 14 is actually a very good summary of this and basically says it's a myth. If, if, if you know, it's not like you're gonna find in these kids in a week a delayed subdural. Delayed bleeding in kids essentially does not happen. And so if you need to allay anybody's fears that this is gonna happen, it just doesn't. Um, what about a non-depressed uh, non uh, skull fracture? Uh, what about the remote, remote miss, risks of intracranial hemorrhage? There is a paper on that here, 15, and they talk about this, kids two and below. First of all, if you pick up a non-depressed skull fracture, what's on the differential list immediately? Child abuse. There's something else going on. Does it mean that they're going to bleed? Will they have intracranial hemorrhage? The answer to that is no. But, but, this, is, but, but this, all I can say is this. Currently, at this point in time, if you've picked up a, a skull fracture, it's in a different risk group. It may not be from later bleeding, but there's got to be something here which pushes you in a direction. Um, and last, the last paper here is what do parents want? <coughs> do they want an immediate CT? Do they want a period of observation? This is the Carpus paper. Patients, parents are divided. Remember when we talked earlier about joint decision making? Jerry was mentioning that. There is no uniform view of the parents. You have to kind of talk to them and you know what we see now, that sort of thing. All I can tell you is the federal government armed us with another arrow. And that is everybody, all these hip modern parents know about radiation uh, to their skull, things like that. When you talk in positive terms about good, we don't have to do this and this, you'll do just fine. But there is no set feeling in the parents. They were very divided in this study as to whether they wanted to wait or, or get an you know, observation or a CT scan. Hopefully you can convince them that the waiting is a good idea. And the truth of the matter is, as we pointed out earlier, after an hour of observation, was anything changed? No, not a bit. I mean, it, basically, if they had something bad, you picked it up the moment they came in. An hour's observation, 
did not change what they needed. Any questions?